might get started. Welcome, Tasmania, to the first Biological Farming Roundtable of 2022. My name is Nicola Maddock, I work at Nutrisoil, and I'm your host for today. Nutrisoil is a big worm farm that produces a worm biology for quality food production. At Nutrisoil, the Biological Farming Roundtable started with about 10 farmers around a table. We got together and we read papers and discussed how we could implement those practices on our farm to regenerate soil. Now here in Tasmania, we have 100 people. We're very, very grateful that you're all here. Our purpose at Nutrisoil is to empower farmers to grow life-enriching food. It is undeniable that how we grow food is deeply connected to human health, soil and environmental health. To help achieve our purpose, we invest our hearts in educating and raising awareness that working with natural systems is indeed working smarter, not harder. I welcome to the stage uh, to present the brilliant world of biology, microbiologist Walter Yena. Walter is an internationally renowned uh, soil microbiologist. Walter has previously worked for the CSIRO and has been a science advisor to Australia's national soil advocate and a speaker at the international UN level. Walter is now on the board of Regenerate Earth, who work both nationally and internationally on growing soils, communities and futures. So thank you, Walter. Thank you very much, Nicola. Can people hear me or I should put this on because they may want to record that as well. There we are. I'll there we go. Uh, right, look, thank you very much, Nicola, and thank you all very much for coming here. It's wonderful to be back in Tasmania. I lived here for about six years in the 1970s. I was with CSRO working in the forests down south, soil microbiology, disease, ecological regeneration. But, and I've been back to Tasmania many times since, uh, partly with my work with John Button and what have you when we're looking at industry innovation futures, including for Tasmania. But basically for the last 15 years I've um, retired. We formed a couple of little NGOs, Healthy Soils Australia and now Regenerate Earth, and very much getting in back into the fundamentals of what we've got to do to, yeah, regenerate the land, Land is critical, you see, because it's you, farmers, land managers, and then soils and land. It's our only basis of agency on this planet for change. And we need change, big time, fundamentally. So the power of farmers, you know, the, the importance of farmers, are actually saying, look, you are the stewards, the custodians of land management, and it's that land management of this planet that's going to govern its hydrology, its climate, its biodiversity, its resilience, and in the biosystem functions, our, our economic stability, our social stability, and as Nicola mentioned, the whole preventative health of humanity. So really, farmers, land management, soil management is really the guts the foundational guts of what we're about, but also it's 10 billion people by 2050 that will be dependent on that fundamentally. And so you farmers matter, and so thank you very much for coming. Uh, obviously, I don't know everything, all the details about what's, you know, what you're doing here in Tasmania, but basically from a fundamental point, let's have the discussion. Let's ask all the questions. So right from front, what we want, this is an interactive forum. You are identifying, hey, okay, what about this problem or what about that direction? And let's then brainstorm and discuss where the thing is going, what we know, what we don't know, what we need to know, what we may need to experiment with but let's actually sort of then look at that higher level to say, okay, how do we make land management, land regeneration, farming, both viable to you 
economically, commercially, but also the foundations for a regenerated, healthy planet. And it's pretty critical because for 50 years, and I, I mean, I've been in this game for 50 years, or more than 50 years. See, I was involved with this Stockholm Earth Summit in 1972, 50 years ago. And we raised all these issues of, yeah, land, limits to growth, resources, cycles, you know, how do we build circular economies? And for 50 years, we've been just spinning our wheels, not in a circular economy, just wasting energy. And we're now at a crunch point because this decade, you know, these up to 2030, unless we build those foundations for the future through resilient biosystems, things are gonna get very serious. And we already know all about those, don't we? I mean, we're seeing climate change, but it's not the CO2, you know, and people don't die until it's 10,000 parts per million CO2, but it's the climate change, the dangerous hydrological extremes that are intensifying, accelerating now. And of course, they're impacting, as we're seeing this week, storms, floods, cyclones, aridification, droughts, wildfires. You see, and it's these dangerous hydrological extremes that are now impacting farming and really critically making farming less and less reliable. So it's not even the amount of rain, but the unreliability. You know, like basically we're working with farmers in Western Australia, eight inches of rainfall, very, very poor soils, but because they had reliability, they could say, yeah, we'd get a crop four years out of five. But as the whole hydrology and seasonality changes, we're now, or the conventional farmers are basically down now two years out of five. Two years out of five is like Russian roulette with four chambers loaded. Because if you've got a mortgage, you're getting income two years out of five, but you're paying interest on your mortgage five out of five, you're dead. Okay, and so this is in a sense how these climate extremes are impacting. Not the CO2, but actually through hydrology extremes, and then the vulnerability of our biosystems, our farming systems to those extremes. And so the message and response, really critical, we have to rebuild buffering. Okay, how do we rebuild resilience in our farming system to buffer these extremes? You know, how do we make that buffer able to tolerate whether we're getting 70 drops or 130 drops, that every one of those raindrops that we get is in the soil, stored in our in-soil reservoirs, available in our soils for sustaining longevity of green growth. Okay, so yes, we're gonna be in these extremes, but have we got the buffering, the resilience? And see, they're the sort of new paradigms of, you know, agricultural futures, the paradigms of have we got actually a capacity to keep on going. There'll be 10 billion people on this planet by 2050, Seven billion will be in concentration camps, we call them cities, but basically they will be totally, and it's a mean word, but they'll be totally dependent and extremely vulnerable because they will need water and food and shelter and habitat and other services every day. And so that is agriculture, right? And so 10 billion people, seven billion in cities, vulnerable. There are seven missed meals, seven missed meals between social stability and chaos. Obviously, you know, if you haven't got, you know, missed seven meals, you're gonna start getting hungry, you're gonna start sort of hustling. And of course then social instability. And again, that's what we're facing this decade. How do we build resilience in biosystems, in farming systems, so we've got the capacity to meet those food needs, the water needs, the stability needs of those people. It's interesting that US Defense Department's very, very heavy people, senior people have got in touch with us and say, wait, <laughs> we're interested in your stuff. I said, well, why are you interested in our stuff? Hey, it's all about stability because they know no amount of hardware, no amount of hardware can maintain social stability if there's seven days with missed meals. So food, water, 
biosystems farming is the guts of a stable future. Now, the only other thing is that you guys got to be paid a fair quid for that, right? Or dollar these days. But the point is you've got to be rewarded and you've got to be viable locally as businesses to make that happen. At the moment, you're getting six cents in the dollar or less growing commodities and getting just basically screwed by a $10 trillion a year global industrial food system. Now, fair enough, we, they're still there, we need them, but hey, you need more than six cents in the dollar. Okay, so how do we get your value capture from that farming, from that resilience that you're getting paid a fair price because you farmers are the people that are actually providing the foundation for the future. So how do you get a fair price? You know, how do you go from six back up to the 30, 40 cents in the dollar for what you're producing? Gets worse than that. Nicola's already mentioned it. You see, we've got a $10 trillion a year industrial food system, but we also globally run a $20, $30 trillion a year industrial disease industry because we now basically got these self-induced diet-related diseases exploding exponentially in populations all over the planet. You know, your cancers, your diabetes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All related to what we put into our faces. The food we eat, or the, it's not food, the lack of nutritional integrity in what we eat. And if we can't sustain that, this stuff is, you know, the diseases are growing exponentially 6%. six percent. We've had COVID, we'll have more of these pandemic crises. So we again have to build resilience, preventative health. The only way you provide, the only way you establish preventative health at a population level is through quality food, the nutritional integrity of your food. We're all animals, we have a biochemistry, that biochemistry needs some 50 essential nutrients in the right forms, concentration, balances, okay? And we need to get that through our food. And the question is, is our food at the moment giving us that? Or has it just been adulterated, marketed, so we get basically, you know, like uh, labels, brands, colors, packaging, more nutrient in the packaging often than in the food. Okay, but it's getting back to nutritional integrity in locally grown, naturally grown food. Basically, that's fundamental to that preventative health. That's, prevent oh, that's fundamental to sort of avoiding that 20, 30 trillion dollar disease industry that we're now locking ourselves into. So you guys, again, farmers critically for the future. You're not recognized for it. Nobody talks to you about that but basically you are it. And so if we're gonna have a future beyond 2030 globally, how do we actually take farming, land regeneration and lift it back up there? It's pretty fundamental actually, sorry. It's pretty fundamental actually because um, you see, when we started, or oh, when we started, 10,000 years ago in the start of the Holocene after the last ice age, we had basically a planet that we evolved on 14 billion hectares of vegetated land, 8 billion hectares of forest, 6 billion hectares of grasslands, savanna grasslands, herbivores, etc. Okay, and basically over the last 8,000 years, we've taken that 14 billion hectares of land, and let's go there, 14 billion, and that was eight forest, six grass. And of course, what we've done is we basically said, look, hey, here's some forest we can clear, burn some forest. And we've taken out minus 6.3 billion hectares of forest. So we had 1.7 billion hectares left, but some of it has regenerated as we've abandoned land. And because we've got another 1.6 billion hectares of regen. And so at the moment, we've got 3.5 roughly of forest on the planet. Okay, so this is in a sense the scale of the challenge we've got. In 8,000 years, we've logged, burnt, 
basically degraded. We've used all of that land actually to grow agricultural crops, obviously, you know, a lot of that's then cropping land. And we brought it back and we've got 3.5 billion hectares residual here. Here we are, 2022. This is United Nations Environment Program figures and yeah, totally no, no arguments about them. The six billion hectares of rangelands, grasslands, again, we've grazed, 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 and we've been very effective. We've still got about one billion hectares of those, original ones, but we've actually converted five billion hectares of man-made desert and wasteland. Okay, so there's desert and wasteland. And wasteland. And so, you know, you, whether you want to go to the Sahara, the Middle East, you know, Gobi Desert, India, parts of the Southwest US, we're excellent at degrading landscapes, right? Creating 5 billion. That's about 40% of the 14 billion hectares originally. Okay, so we've had an enormous impact because of this is poor grassland management, fires, overgrazing, desertification, aridification. Obviously some of this land here, we've converted into grassland. We've got about 1.5 billion hectares of actually cropland that we crop, and we're about 50% through that. You know, we've basically used up 50% in terms of soil productivity, soil carbon on that. And then we've basically got another about, what is it, about 4 billion hectares of uh, current grassland. So we've taken that forest and converted it into cropland and grassland, and there you are, that's roughly the 6.3. Well, not quite, because we've still got 1 billion left there. But what I'm getting at is we have had an enormous, profound effect on this planet. And people blame agriculture, and of course, agriculture has been part of this, but the message today is agriculture is also the solution. Because just as we degrade land, we can also regenerate land. And that's the positive message, right? We can actually understand what we've done, what we need to do, and how to go back. How do we actually regenerate this land? How do we rehydrate? Can we take one billion hectares of desert and wasteland and can we rehydrate, regreen, regenerate? Yes, we can. You know, can we reforest? Obviously, yes, we can. Tasmania, classic example. Can we actually rebuild the productivity, the health, the structure of these cropping soils? Yes, we can. But we must do that because basically, as you saw four years ago, Syria, Syria, the cradle of Western agriculture, the fertile crescent, where agriculture started 8,000 years ago, desert. And we had 4 million climate refugees moving into Europe, social instability. And we've got about 20 billion, sorry, 20 million people, you know, in that cusp at the moment. Desertification, degradation, people walking off land, social instability. And so how do we actually sort of turn that around and regenerate and create new habitat. And in a sense, that's the sort of task agriculture has got. Because you are the only basis of land management agency for change. Politicians, yeah, I mean, they're, they're good. They, they have a lot of bullshit and we can use that in agriculture. But the point is they, they aren't going to do anything except talk, okay? And it's actually only the grassroots on the ground farmer activities that can make that happen. Okay, so look, um, you're very, very important. And let's get to the important part of it. It's not the fact that there's been degradation, there has, but what is it that we can and must do to regenerate land? And in a sense, in that, to regenerate the viability of farming, critically important, you know, the fact that you, you're gonna earn, have to earn money on it and be viable but more important, provide humanity and the earth with a future beyond 2030. I mean, things will still be there 2030, but it'll get harder and harder and harder unless, unless we do that. 
So this has been a bit gloomy, but the good news, the good news, and this is a take-home message, very simple. The good news is, yes, we can. Okay? And we can do that safely, naturally, rapidly. And how? Just as nature did it. By regenerating the earth's soil carbon sponge. Okay? Those simple words. Regenerate earth soil carbon sponge. Okay, and that's a bit wacko perhaps in the minute, but when you think about it, that's exactly what happened. Come down to some microbiology. Obviously, we guys, we go back to 3.8 billion years ago, the first life on land, you know, like a, a volcanic vent in the deep oceans, minerals coming out, and then the first microbes formed, evolved around those vents. And they've been around for 3.8 billion years. But really what was powerful and what happened was 420 million years ago. Because the oceans would develop life, they built more and more complex life, eukaryotic cells, multicellular organisms, and they're all limited by nutrients. And those nutrients, of course, were leaching from the land in the oceans, but nutrients became the limiting factor. Farming, very relevant. Nutrients, still limiting factors, but so this is important. Nutrients were the limiting factor. And so basically, if you go 420 million years ago, yeah, we had oceans and then we had land. The land was just basically bare rock, dry desert, right? There was no life on land. All the life was in the oceans, right? So there was life here in the oceans, but nothing on land. But of course, it depended on nutrients leaching from the soil, the rock, into the oceans, that was the limiting factor. So straight away, competition and what have you, hey, if that's the limiting factor, I need more of it. And that's exactly what happened. We'll make these guys green. And what happened is that basically organisms evolved from the estuarine edges, grew, grew up onto the land to solubilize nutrients. And of course, to do that, they had to have transport mechanisms. And in fact, these were our fungi. Fungi, fungals, no, no sexism, funguses. Okay, so these fungi tubes, mycelial, microscopic mycelial tubes, evolved, colonized the land to solubilize nutrients and bring nutrients. Okay, so they're solubilizing nutrients, bringing those nutrients back to their mates in the oceans. Fungi are like us, they're effectively proto-animals, they're very closely to us genetically, right? And we and they can't photosynthesize, we can't create our own energy. The only things that can do that are plants and algae, or pl algae are primitive plants. So these guys got smart and they sort of said, okay, if I form a symbiosis, a partnership with blue-green algae, then I have actually both the nutrient solubilization capacity plus a sugar factory to keep me happy. And so these guys actually have a name. We see them all around us at the moment. And of course, these are the lichens. Okay, so these lichens were symbioses of, of course, of the fungi. They were green. And then, if you like, blue-green algae. I should put that blue, shouldn't I? Um, Okay, and so these then were independent symbiotic associations that could solubilize, could fix carbon, could go AWOL, right? They could just go autonomously. They didn't have to be in the oceans. And very, very rapidly, it's these lichens that then spread all across this rocky landscape. We see them everywhere now, you know, rotting our rocks, rotting our wood, rotting plastic even our cars, right? So, so they, these guys are really special. And what's special about them is they've got acids and they are basically solubilizing that rock through these organic acids that they release. And in doing so, they are actually leaving behind organic detritus in the mineral detritus that they have formed. And that's really quite simple, but absolutely profound. Because let's draw that. You start off with a rock, and a rock is an aggregation of a whole lot of mineral particles. 
Okay, all fused together. But of course, some of them are really good. You've got some potassium and you've got calcium, you know, minerals. So very valuable things, but they're all tight together. And the fact is that basically being tight and squeezed together, you can't get them. They're all unavailable, right? They're all not available. And of course, this has got a bulk density, you know, the weight per gram, so just say 2.6 to 3.5 grams per cc. That's, uh, you know, the weight of a rock. It's heavy, you drop it on your foot, it hurts. Also, if you have water falling on rock by itself, you know exactly what happens. It'll just run off and get lost, won't it? And of course, what these lichens did, they actually sort of changed all that because they then took these mineral particles and solubilized them and left behind organic detritus. You know, their cell walls. And so we can draw those cell walls as little bed springs, if you like. You know, this is just organic detritus between the mineral particles. And all they did is create the earth, soil, carbon sponge. Okay, the same material, they just made a sponge out of it. But that had a profound effect. By, just in terms of figures, a healthy soil's got a bulk density of about 1.2 grams per cc. Okay, and so this is telling you straight away, well look, um, two thirds of this sponge is just air. So how do I make a sponge? I add nothing air, space, voids. Okay, so simply the act of these fungi breaking down, solubilizing rock, taking that rock to make this sponge, you create healthy soils. And it's that simple. Nature did it for 20 million years ago. Okay. And we can do that, and we must do that now, everywhere, as rapidly and as extensively as possible. Because if we do that, profound things happen just by adding nothing. Okay? Okay. We've got a drop of water falling on this thing, same drop of water, what happens to it? It infiltrates. It's retained on these film as films around these particles, doesn't it? Okay? And so basically now we have water retention. We have a thing called in-soil reservoirs. Okay? Two-thirds of the volume, you know, two grams per cc, potentially of I mean, sorry, not, not per cc. But basically that mineral particle made into sponge can hold two grams of water. Okay, so it's enormous water retention. And of course that water retention is of course critical for enabling more microbial growth, more plant growth. Okay, now we're in a situation where we're in Tasmania, we had healthy, naturally well-structured soil, we had in-soil reservoirs across this countryside, you know, two, three meters deep, holding water. We had rainfall coming in regularly, but basically we were able to have ag agriculture and stunning forests on rain-fed soil sponges, in-soil reservoirs. We didn't need irrigation, did we? Justin? Well, the return is cubic centimeters. Cubic centimeters, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so the point is that the whole hydration of those landscapes is made possible by the creation of this sponge, by adding nothing. I can't even sell you bottles of nothing, you know, I, mean, I could, but you wouldn't want to buy, pay for it, would you? Nothing. Just letting the fungi, the microbial ecology create this structure for us. Gets much better than that. Here we've got our phosphorus, our calcium, you know, our different nutrients, unavailable, right? Very poor fertility. Now we've got that phosphorus, we've got that calcium available, and of course we've got microbial activity. 
and it's actually able to solubilize and get access to these nutrients. And all of a sudden, the biofertility of this soil can increase tenfold. Not because there's more nutrients there, no, the same nutrients, but they become available, they become accessible. They become able to be cycled in that soil. Okay, so nature can, by just simply adding nothing, enhance the biofertility of those soils through availability and cycling. Now we come back to our agriculture. We came to Tasmania, there were spongy soils, available nutrients naturally cycling, fungal processes solubilizing them, fungal processes cycling them, and we grew massive crops without fert fertilizers. And progressively as we've degraded both the microbiology and the structure of our soil, because in a sense we've been going back to more compacted, degraded soils, what's happened, we've lost biofertility. Okay? Sure, we can buy fertilizer, but that's getting expensive. It's getting more and more expensive. And the issue is long-term sustainability, how do we go into, yeah, the sponge? Take it further. Let's look at another color, oh, blue. Let's look at the rootability of these soils, right? What happens if we try to get a root into that rock? No chance, it has to go to the side, can't grow, can it? Whereas here, basically you get a root, a seedling root coming down, it can proliferate massively throughout that soil volume. It can proliferate meters down. So the root soil interface to access water, to access nutrient, is enormously, many factor times improved. Okay, and so here's the productivity because what's the basis of productivity? Yeah, that root soil interface, access to water, access to nutrients without for irrigation, without fertilizer. That's how nature drives productivity. All because of adding nothing to the soil. Same thing goes now if we look at the whole microbial ecology of the soil, right? If we're saying, okay, well, look how much life is in this rock, well, bugger all. How much life is in that soil? There's more life, there's more living biomass in a gram of healthy soils than there is, in a sense, well, hang on, in a hectare of healthy soils than there is on the biomass living above the surface. You know, the weight of life in a healthy soil much higher below ground than above the ground. Fungal hyphae proliferating all the, through these soils, massive thing. I've, I've sat down, I mean, when I was Syro, I sat down and measured these things. 25,000 kilometers, kilometers of fungal hyphae in a cubic meter of healthy soil. Twice the diameter of the earth in a cubic meter of healthy, and all these hyphae are doing something very, very special. Okay, if we draw a soil particle, and basically, yeah, you might have a uh, oh, color. Okay, you might have a root here. Hang on, here's a root here, out there, but it's not necessarily there, uh, able to con connect well. But the fungi they're in a different game entirely because these are growing all over the surfaces of these mineral particles, and these. Fungal hyphae are taking up nutrients directly, actively from these mineral surfaces across into their membranes. Okay, so they are actually sourcing out, hunting and solubilizing and taking up nutrients from these surfaces. So there's your P and your cadmium and your magnesium. I mean, they're not one mineral particle, but basically, you know, they're taking them up directly and of course bringing them up into their hyphae and then exchanging them with the, the root because this is a symbiotic root plant, the mycorrhizal plant, and they're interchanging these nutrients for sugars from that plant. You know, that's how nature works. 
And of course, we've got a completely different nutrient uptake processes from these mycorrhizal membranes solubilizing nutrients compared to a hydroponically grown plant. Because if we have a plant here hydroponically grown by itself, the only nutrients it can get is from, uh, are from the soil solution, right? So here's a soil solution, and that has sol dissolved nutrients in it. It's got its sodium, its potassium, its nitrate, but also toxins often, you know, cadmium, aluminium, it's very acid. And it's absorbing these nutrients effectively from the liquid soil solution. But all the essential cations that our plants need and we need for our preventative health, you know, the, the 50 odd essential trace elements and you know, cations, they're sorbed onto these soil surfaces. They're not in the soil solution. So the nutritional integrity of this plant is less than 30% of a healthy natural mycorrhizal plant growing through the use of these membrane uptake processes. And this is a profound difference because this governs the nutritional integrity of our food. Okay? So basically when you grow plants hydroponically, you're getting completely different nutritional complement. You get a lot of the soluble ions, the things you've added as soluble fertilizer, your, your nitrate, et cetera, et cetera, sulfates, but you're not getting all these trace elements, these nutrients. And so you've completely compromised the nutritional integrity of that food. That nutritional integrity of the food is directly related to preventative health. Okay, that's at 20 trillion dollars a year disease industry driver. Okay? And so, again, we are able to grow healthy plants on healthy soils to keep healthy people healthy if we are actually saying, here are these natural soil nutrient absor absorption processes, and we get that by adding nothing, just having healthy sponges. Okay? And, and so that's in a sense what we're offering or what we're putting there. Here's nature and nature achieved all these things through this simple thing of building the sponge. Okay? And we can as well. So it comes down the whole productivity of natural biosystems, the resilience of natural biosystems, the buffering of natural biosystems, was all related to these pedogenesis, these soil forming processes, the process of the sponge. And then all the hydrology, the biofertility, the rootability, the microbial ecology, and the nutritional integrity that it enabled. And we have access and ability to do all of that again, through simply rebuilding the Earth's soil carbon sponge. A any questions, arguments, stones, throw things, tomatoes? Yeah. Organic? <laughs> no, no, it doesn't have to be organic, I can cop it. You tell us how to rebuild the sponge. All right, okay, yes, yes, good, thanks. Sh shut up, guy, and let's get on to the real stuff and tell us how to do it. <laughs> right. So if that's the case, see, that was the next page. You turn the page and then you say, well, how the bloody hell do we do it? Right, so let's cross all that out. Okay, so the thing is, how do we do it? Yeah, because that's, that's the important thing. And of course, uh, it's very, very, very simple. Obviously, nature doesn't buggerize around and make it complex because if we can make it simple, why don't we? And it's as simple as A, B, and C. Okay? And it goes like this. A, B, C. That's a plant. There's some roots. Okay, it's all about A, B, and C. 
And it starts, of course, with A, which is, of course, you guys, agriculture. Okay? And it's about growing plants. It's maximizing plant growth, right? What we do really well. Maximizing the very beautiful thing you take CO2 with some water, and you put some sunlight there. And you end up with carbohydrates, C6H12O6, plus this waste stuff we call oxygen. Okay, photosynthesis. So you start, we'll get over here again. You start with a simple photosynthesis, agriculture, maximizing the productivity of plant growth per square meter, per acre, per hectare, per catchment, per crop. You know, the things that you excel at. But you've already heard from the previous slide, yeah, I can do that not by moron, moron, moron. I can do that by sponge, okay, by building healthy soils because I can maximize water, biofertility, rootability, resilience, productivity through the sponge. So the whole issue is, yeah, maximizing agriculture, A. And of course, we do this really well. The best I know of is 500 tons of biomass per hectare per annum. And that's a sewage pond growing water hyacinths in Alabama. <laughs> but we don't want to all be in a sewage pond in Alabama, but sugarcane does Queensland. Sugarcane, we did, used to do 200 tons per hectare per annum. Okay, out of sugar cane. We don't do now. Now we only grow 80 tons. With all the inputs, we only can get 80 to 100 tons. But we used to grow 200 tons. Your forest, you know, nature, your basically obliqua, regnans, regrowth forest, yeah, they're doing 40 tons. Uh, this is, again, above ground data, right? We'll come into below ground in a minute. So yeah, we can grow that, but doesn't, don't beat yourself up at the numbers, the quantity, because as long as you're doing it, so even if you're growing five tons of sustainable pasture, hey, that's fantastic, right? It's taking sunlight, CO2, water, turning it into, turning into this whole thing, this makes sugars, and that makes the world go around, that's a food for it, the whole biosphere, right? It's one simple process. Oxygen a waste product, but of course we need it to live. And the quantity. But what matters is not the quantity. And this is a real important point because we've lived in this world of agriculture and in a sense we have excelled in A, right? And that's the last sort of 8,000 years. We've basically, as we saw, we've colonized that land surface. We've maximized A. But everything that grows has to, of course, die and cycle. And this is where we have to step into a new dimension. Because it's not what we grow, but what happens to every gram that we do grow. What happens to every gram of sugar, biomass that we produce? And there's two things, only two things right through evolution of life on this planet, only two things that can happen to that. Okay, it can either be, burn, or it can be biodigested. Okay, so it can, or it can basically, um, okay, well, biodigest. Or basically, put more crudely, or not crudely, but more directly, it's either fire or fungi. You see, because these are the agents that are driving it. Okay, so whatever we grow, we can either burn it slowly, as if when we're respiring and digesting it, or through fire rapidly, and turn it back. Just fire is just reversing this equation, isn't it? It's just turning it back into CO2 emissions, water, steam, and of course a lot of heat energy is released in the fire. It consumes oxygen. It's just a simple reverse of photosynthesis. So that's the fire equation. 
or we can burn it by, you know, slowly as when we eat it and respire it. Or we can biodigest it, see, make that green, and we basically, again, through fungi, and we turn that into stable soil carbon. Okay, and these are the humates, and then the glomalin. And these are really just uh, nothing special biochemically, they're just basically long chains of carbon molecules that get bigger and bigger, polymerize bigger and bigger, and they become very stable and very hard to break down. And so they sit and reside in that soil a hundred to a thousand years. You know, so all the coal, all the, you know, humates, the peats, they're just basically biomass that's been turned by fungi into stable soil carbon, humates, glomalin, etc. And they're sitting there. So these, these are really, well, so let's get simple. These are really the bed springs we talked about, right? So really, it's a matter of do we burn? Yeah, are we into the burning business or in the bed spring business? Fire versus fungi, bi bi I mean, yeah, burning or biodigestion, bi bi right? And so what our objective is, is to maximize this, right? Like clearly we want to maximize A, but then what we want to make sure is that, I mean, we can have burning. I mean, we must have burning because that's what we live of but that we don't burn all of it. You know, that we basically put a fair share back into the soil capital to rebuild the Earth's soil carbon sponge. You know, so if we can put 70% of it down here, down under, and 30% there, then we're forever building more and more spongy, productive, resilient biosystems. Conversely, if we do 100% up here, just burn it all off, then we're basically not starving this thing down below and progressively degrading that biosystem. So we in farming, in our land management, are in charge of this ratio, the, the agency over this, how much is burnt, how much is actually put into soil capital. And the wise thing is to say, can we put half of it back down as rebuilding soil capital? We're already ahead of the game. Nature's helping us all the time because, sure, here's a plant above the ground, and that basically normally is about 40% of the biomass, but then nature mostly puts 30% of the biomass in its roots and another 30% of its biomass as root exudates, the sugars that it exudes from its roots to feed the soil microbial ecology because, hey, without that, it can't function either. So in a sense, 60% of the biomass is already down under. So we're way in front, you know, like all we have to do is say, hey, 60% is already down under. How do I make sure that that's actually fixed and stable and turned into stable soil carbon to give us, you know, this down there. At the moment, our agriculture, because we're adding all these oxidative inputs and oxidative practices, Actually, it's really serious because at the moment we're burning 120% of A is going up as CO2. Okay, and I'll show you how, what happens. You can, if we cultivate, if we over fertilize, if we have biocides, obviously fire up here as well. And if we have fallows, fallows, yeah, bare fallows, see all of those sort of practices are basically taking carbon from our soils, from our landscape, putting them back up into the air. And so we end up with, we end up with 120% of A going up because we're not just taking 100% of A, we're taking 20% of the heritage legacy original soil carbon that we inherited, right? We are mining those soils for the carbon. I said we've got 1.5 billion hectares of cropping soils on this planet. That's about it, not many more. 
and we're halfway through. And so you'll see the UN say, hey, we've got 60 crops left before we've buggered the soil completely, right? And that's true because we're halfway through that oxidation. This agriculture, these practices collectively, they're losing five to 10 tons of carbon per hectare per annum. Okay, so our conventional high import farming is losing that much. We're saying, look here, this is how much A was producing and we're just losing, losing, losing. And in that process, desertifying, compacting, degrading. But we don't need to do that because as we said, the sweet spot, we only need 30% up here. If we have 70% down there, we're building soil capital, we're building bed spring, humates, glomalin, and progressively making that much, much more productive, healthy, structured, resilient, buffered soil. Okay, so it's a very simple thing, A, B, C. We're in charge, farmers in charge. Farmers in charge of A, they know world experts are doing this, but now the new paradigm, the new dimension is realizing it's what you do to every gram of carbon that sunlight produces for you. Are we allowing it to burn through our practices or are we helping to put it into the soil? There's one actually very important thing is, yeah, how do we help this process along? And basically, how do we help the fungi along? And of course, this is where the biostimulants come in. Okay, and again, biostimulants are simple, natural products that actually stimulate the activity of fungi and microbes in the soil to do these soil carbon fixation processes, and my cup of tea is sitting on a drum of it. Okay? Because that's exactly what a worm juice does, right? Worm juices, etc. They're just nature's biostimulants. And we've got then innovative companies are saying, yeah, hey, we can produce these worm juices in very, very, you know, very sort of concentrated but effective, effective forms. And that stimulates the actual soil microbial ecology in the soil that helps build the sponges and the bed springs and puts more of that carbon into this end. But it does something actually more important. I'll put my cup back down again because I shouldn't be drinking while on stage, should I? Um, basically, it does something more because we've got a vacant space here, have we? And basically, in nature, you don't have vacant spaces. It's not kosher. And so we've got to have another thing called D. And we call these our dividends. And this is really where the rubber hits the road and you know, money comes into it. Because for every gram of carbon we can put into the soil through C, and not just piss up into the air as uh, CO2, for every gram we can hold 20 grams of extra soil water in the soil, up to eight grams within the organic matrix, but another 10, 12 grams in the structure, you know, as we saw in the sponge in those soil surfaces. So we can massively increase the water holding capacity of those soils. The in-soil reservoirs we talked about, you know, three meters of um, soil moisture available to plant roots, and even below that, water draining to recharge the aquifers and the groundwater layer. So it really is every gram of carbon from C is giving us this force multiplier, positive feedback, benefit and rehydration. Every gram of carbon we put into that soil as C is massively increasing the biofertility of that soil. Again, we explained that with that little duck rock diagram. It can give us a factor 10 biofertility dividend in the sense we only have to add a third of the nutrients that you're adding now, and often these nutrients are being pretty damaging in oxidation roles. So we add a third of the nutrients, as well as we get three, four times the availability of those nutrients and three, four times increased cycling of those nutrients. 
See, so we're really, again, positive feedback. We need less, we make it more available, we cycle it more, and the plant's in that sweet spot having all the nutrients that one needs. It's another thing with nutrients, very important. Take nitrate, for example. You know, a plant naturally needs 20, 30 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per annum. This is not a plant, plants, crops. You see, and it's that Goldilocks sweet spot. That's the optimum. Sure, if we have less than that, we've got a problem, reduced growth. If we put more than that, we've got a far bigger problem because we're basically making that soil super abundant. We're making it toxic to the bugs that are doing this. We're volatilizing or leaching a lot of that extra nitrate we put on. But the really dangerous thing, as we put on extra nitrate here, we are oxidizing carbon out of the soil. Okay? Every gram of excess nitrogen will oxidize some 20 grams of carbon out of your soil. And so it'll really just be driving the degradation of your soils. You'll be concreting your catchments because of that nitrogen. And of course, then you'll say, I need more fertilizer and nutrients and I need irrigation because the soil's buggered. <laughs> I need water, I need nutrients as inputs. Okay, so basically by putting every gram of carbon in here, we can increase the biofertility, the availability of the cycling, but we can have a factor 10 efficiency dividend. Every gram of carbon we put in the soil, we've already talked about it, we can increase the rootability of the soil. The proliferation of roots and hyphae and microbial ecology in that soil. Okay, we've talked about the 25,000 kilometers of fungal hyphae per cubic meter of soil. The rootability and the resilience and the capacity to resist droughts. Root shoot ratios as in nature of 10 to 1 rather than the 1 to 10 that our high input fertilized crops are getting. Okay? So we're really investing in roots because roots are the things that gives us dividends with minimal inputs. Okay, so basically that's roots. We can go on further if you want to talk about diseases, every gram of carbon. We build the biodiversity, the, the microbial diversity activity in that soil and of course that's what resists diseases because basically no disease can get to pandemic proportions if it's got all these neutralizing other organisms in the soil. There's lots of specific examples we can go into. But really the whole point is, and this is profound, it's these dividends that actually drive the productivity and resilience of productive biosystems. And this is also profound. It's actually these dividends that drove natural productivity of A, because that's where the water, the nutrients, the rootability, the disease control was that allowed agriculture to put prodigious quantities of carbon from the air. Okay, so nature drove productivities not through moron strategies. Nature drove productivities through D the dividends generated through putting carbon in the soil. One more profound thing was that if we have these dividends D, hey Charlie, we don't need any of these things, do we? Because we've been doing all this to try and increase A. But if A is being driven by these dividends, we don't need all these negative moron inputs. So then we get to minimal input, highly productive, resilient agriculture that's regenerating soil capital, sustainable, productive, securing our future. Any problems with that argument? Um, I have a, a, a comfortable with all of the uh, issues around around that with regard to pasture developments. Um, I'm challenged by how you don't cultivate with regard to root cropping. 
Okay, no, no, good, good. Okay, look, and the, yeah, these are the principles. Now, when we get a particular thing, uh, we've got competitive plants, and we want this plant particularly, because that's our crop plant, and there's some more competitive bastards out there that'll take the space, and so how do we create the niche for our plant against these competitors? And yeah, there, there's challenges there, I agree. So we're taking the big system, uh, just to answer that question specifically, yeah, we, we can actually put all these factors, A, B, C optimization, in a pellet around the seed of that particular plant you want. So that plant through that pellet has a competitive advantage in that environment vis-a-vis -vis the wild competitive plants, right? Or the wild you know, the plants that would otherwise compete. So how do we tip the balance? And we are putting inputs in a pellet, but how do we tip the ecological balance in favor of the plant we want through that microsite manipulation rather than having to nuke a whole landscape? Okay, and so, yeah, we can sit down and design that. Um, a good colleague, for example, Colin Sice, has pioneered pasture cropping where again he uses grazing ecologies to create a seed bed, opportunistically to put then cereal crops into a grassland. At the right season, under the right conditions, those grasslands will put a cereal crop up. You know, harvest a cereal crop, 80, 90% of normal yields, and then the competition is coming up underneath the cereal crop and of course, you'll just graze in the stubble and the competition to produce more protein and more biofertilizers and animals. So, so it's just us playing natural microbial ecologies, but yeah, tailor making those strategies for whatever your problem or the opportunity that you're trying to optimize. Okay, but yeah, very sophisticated. So we're not, we're not just saying, hey, dumb down. And there's, okay, and I should, I, I'm a bit harsh actually. I shouldn't say none of this. Of course we can use it, but we use it intelligently to optimize a system rather than we're relying on inputs which we know are just robbing the natural soil capital and the future of that landscape. Okay, and so it's tailor-making those optimal strategies. And that's in a sense what the smart natural farmers, organic farmers have been doing. They've been perfecting these mechanisms. Yes, if I grow this earlier, then it's established before the competition starts, or I can mulch and smother the competition, or I can bring animals in to sort of take out the competition at the right time. You know, there's a whole lot of, yeah, sophisticated smarts but these are locally tailor made. But what I'm really trying to get through here, A, B, C, D, is the fact is that, yeah, this is the basis of redesigning agriculture. But we're not really redesigning because all we're doing is just doing what nature, nature does A, B, C, D, right? So all we're doing is we're getting back in the groove, but the powerful thing, and it comes back to your question partly, the powerful thing, this now allows us to do something really, really special. I work with Vijay Kumar in Andhra Pradesh in India, and basically, yeah, they've got desert, right? They've got some of this five billion hectares of man-made desert and wasteland. Land that's basically brown, dry, desiccated at the moment for 80% of the time, bit of green every monsoon, if they get the monsoon, but a bit of green, but then it's back to brown desert. And we're turning that country into 365 day green plant cover. Exactly through those sort of strategies. You know, like how do we get pre-monsoon dry seeding into those things, get those plants established before the monsoon so they're optimally able to exploit the rain from the monsoon, grow rapidly and create actually a protective um, cover, uh, plant cover, soil cover, that lasts 365 days of the year. And it's working extremely well. And of course, it's exactly how nature colonizes deserts. You know, when we go out to our deserts, where we took this thing from, 
You know, like, yeah, that's exactly how nature says, right, I'm getting these pioneer plants that are working in this way. They're getting water, nutrients in an exceptionally efficient way that allows them to sustain their green cover. By sustaining green cover, they're changing the whole habitat and progressively allowing those deserts to be regreened. 95% of Australia's deserts are still vegetated. See, it's, I mean, nature's, she can do it. That's the evidence. And now we can say, can we use that same process understanding to start regenerating? The target is 1 billion hectares of arid wasteland back into green rangeland and savannah. Okay, so that's in the sense the story about, okay, how do we do it? The person asked, yeah, let's get on to how we do it. And it's again profound because in this way, and again, we don't have to do that, we can just do 10, 20 tonnes of carbon per hectare per annum, we can actually totally change not just agriculture, resilience, food security, but of course we can actually draw down massive quantities of carbon. Okay? Basically, every year, there's some 250... Okay, we should draw this, perhaps. There's some 250 billion tonnes of carbon. Does it... And we might be able to turn this over, eh? There's some 250 billion tonnes of carbon that are in flux on this planet, right? So that's 250. Our total fossil fuel emissions of carbon voila! Our total fossil fuel emissions of carbon thank you so much Natasha uh, uh, Nicola okay our total fuel, fossil fuel emissions of carbon are about 8 billion tonnes and this was, of course, our friend Charles Keeling back in 1960. And you remember the graph, don't you? There's CO2 going up. And, of course, here's CO2 going up. OK, this is CO2. This is time. And, yeah, he, he sort of showed the world Hawaii. Yep, there's CO2 going up. And every year there was 130 billion tonnes of carbon being emitted by Earth and 120 billion tonnes of carbon being actually drawn down again by our residual green vegetation, right? But every year there was a deficit of 10 billion tonnes of carbon and of course that deficit added up and there's CO2 rising from what was then 280 parts per million and it's now 416 parts per million, right? Okay, and so that's the CO2 climate story as we hear it. But what really, in a sense, we have to be honest about is fossil fuels that do 8 billion tonnes of carbon emissions, all our human use of fossil fuels on the planet. But because 8 and 10 were very simple and they're clear, everyone understood it, the message politically was that, hey, we've got to stop fossil fuel use, otherwise we can't turn this CO2 level down. Okay? And of course, you can't do that because one, if you stop fossil fuel use, you've got to look for volunteers and the answer is there's 8 billion of us now and so we've got to call hands up. We want, you know, we want 7 billion people to do Hari Kari tomorrow morning. Hands up, anyone? See, nobody wants to volunteer. You see, because basically we crash economies, we crash societies, it's... It's, yeah, how we go. So it's a ridiculous proposition. What they haven't told us is that, in fact, there's 250 billion tonnes of flux a year. Why they haven't told us that? They basically say, oh, look, that's nature's problem. <laughs> or that's nature's carbon, right? We're not responsible. We're politicians. We're just responsible here. Well, it's all bullshit, of course, because they have, you know, um, 
landfills, they have cement, they have you know, a whole lot of other emissions apart from fossil fuels. But basically we're also generating, there's more fossil fuels, I mean, sorry, there's more carbon emissions generated from wildfires than there are from fossil fuels. But that was again nature's problem because we just kick externalize the responsibility of that back to nature. Okay, well, here's the figures. There's 350 million hectares of forests that burn every year. Okay, and they emit from 20 to 200 tons of carbon per hectare while they're burning. Okay, so, so I mean, it's, <laughs> you just do the sums. It's seven to way above fossil fuel emissions every year from wildfires. So the issue becomes, hey, it's not shutting down economies and crashing <coughs> societies. It's about, can we reduce wildfires? And of course, yes, we can. How do you reduce wildfires? We had it on ABC, fire versus fungi. If we can, okay, you and Tassie, here's your forest. That forest is putting down litter at the rate of eight tons of eight tons of carbon per hectare per annum. You know, this is litter that's falling down, right? And of course, that litter is on the ground. Now, the question is: the question is, does it stay on the ground and accumulate, as in California? So you end up with thirty tons of litter per hectare, and so California burns every third year. It has to, because with that fuel, it's just accident waiting to happen. Or do you have fungi that can actually biodegrade that litter, okay, and turn it into stable soil carbon? So this is what nature does. You see how clever is she? because she takes the negative, the fuel that drives the disaster, and says, bugger that, I'm just going to use these fungi, convert it into humates, and now I've got stable soil carbon, but you've already seen it, I've got all this hydrology because I've got stable soil carbon. So I've removed the fuel, but I've also rehydrated that landscape so it can't burn, or doesn't burn, or is less likely to burn. And of course, because I've rehydrated that landscape, it's growing better than it was before. So where's the complaint? Nature's way ahead. And can we use that understanding? You know, can we use that ecology of, I need another green, but it doesn't matter. Can we use that ecology of fungal biodegradation as a fire prevention strategy because we've got more emissions from that source than we have from fossil fuels globally. And it's all beneficial. Okay? And so these are the sort of opportunities that come, but we farming, thinking beyond the status quo. The other thing is, I mean, there's lots of steps in this thing, but the other thing is, see, 120 billion tonnes of carbon drawdown by our residual green. Okay, but if we're going to regenerate soils, we can increase that residual green. We've already said, look, we're working on half the green on this planet that we were 10,000 years ago. You know, UNEP figures of land degradation. But if we can regenerate, extend the longevity of green growth, put green covers over arid landscape, we can probably put a 50% increase in photosynthetic drawdown in that dividend, I mean, in that function. Okay, so bottom line, if you add all these things up, we can easily, sustainably, draw down 20 billion tons of carbon per annum by 2030. That gives us 10 billion tonnes of carbon negative net, net emissions by 2030. And farmers are getting carbon credits now, aren't they? 
So what's the carbon credits on 20 billion tons of carbon drawdown? Yeah, $50 a ton, $100 a ton, you do the sums. Okay, so that's where the potential is. Regenerative agriculture, natural farming systems, thinking outside the square, but you guys in the driver's seat because farmers, you have agency. You have the land, you're in control of A, B, C, D. You have all the levers. And what you've got to get together is saying, okay, where's agriculture going in the future? And where are the tools that I'm going to use it? And the point that the Carla raised, you know, the brilliance of soil microbial ecology is all these agencies, fungi, these fungals, the funguses, right? that we can use as our friends to help drive and switch on these changes. Okay, and then the biostimulants and the sharp strategic intelligent design of, you know, smart systems to make them sing and dance for us. So I think the Carla's standing there because uh, you've heard enough of me. No, I haven't ended you. I'm just letting you know it's 15 minutes and if you want to open up for questions. Yes, yeah, no, no, we will, yes. That's, I'm um, no, and she wasn't just a heavily body standing there, she was telling me something, you see. So the point is that, um, you know, really, that's, that's what's so powerful, right? So it's an enormous, enormous new paradigm for agriculture. Get out of the six cents and the dollar getting flogged for commodities. Get out of degrading the land, you know, being forced to degrade. Get out of degrading your health and the health of the whole community through the compromised nutritional integrity of your food and saying, look, here are natural, healthy, regenerative systems and it's only you in these systems that can save the future. So you're important. And so we're very, very keen to be here, helping any way we can as teams, locally, on the ground, grassroots innovation and making it happen. But as Nicola just said, look, let's have some discussion, you know, throw tomatoes, ask curly questions, let's have discussion, but also particularly if there's particular problems that are local, you know, like, hey, why do I, why do I need irrigation or whatever? Let, let, yeah, let's have that debate. So go for it. Oh, okay. There's, hang on. There's a gentleman down here, right? Please. Back to your, your ABC on the other side yep. of the board there. You're talking about the fertiliser input. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. Would you want to talk in the mic? Because that way we can uh, perhaps record or better hand. Yep. We've got to turn it on. No, no. Just it's on. Okay. So back on the B side there. Yeah. Um, fertiliser inputs, and you, and you said that we can overdose on... Nitrogen, yeah, excess, yes. excess of nitrogen. So does that include our legumes, like clovers and that? So we can have too much legume? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. If you have a monoculture, okay, well, yes, you can. If you have a monoculture of too much clover and you're just clover, clover, and you're managing it just clover, it can get, well, put it aside, it can have too much, but nature doesn't allow that to happen because it'll just stagnate, right? Because there won't be any competitive advantage of putting more nitrogen in there, and therefore the clover loses its competitive edge, right? And you'll probably get some opportunistic, nitrogen loving weeds take over your clover, nettles or something, right? So, yeah, nature, look, nature always balances it. Uh, see, the other thing about ecology, very important lesson, farmers and leaders, if you can't beat it, you eat it. <laughs> okay? If you can't beat it, you eat it. So everything is balanced, everything is cycled, and hey, if you get too cocky, we'll have you for lunch. Thank you. Uh, one at the back, yeah? Thank you. Um, how do you stimulate the fungi in forests when, when the, climate, the climate's getting hotter and drier, yeah. which is how quickly can they evolve? Right. No, no, look, and, and you should join the team because we need answers from you. <laughs> That's the challenge. How do we stimulate the fungal activity in those forests? Definitely because it's getting drier, it's aridifying, 
it gets to a certain dryness, the fungi can't operate anymore, right? In, in, in situ, then you have to have special situations. Actually, this is, thank you, good question. And the answer is, look, anything, every organism needs three things. It needs genetics, you know, what's my genetic capability? What's my tucker, my substrate? Have I got enough of that? And have I got a conducive environment that lets me, you know, operate? And so we try to understand and then say, yeah, can I create that right environment? But in terms of substrate, yeah, obviously it's using the litter. In terms of conducive conditions, can I add some biostimulant to actually help those fungi? Often it's parts per billion of trace minerals or cofactors, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But nature provides them in, you know, worm juices and those sorts of things. Um, Big challenge though, yeah, how do I optimize the fungi? A lot of the time it's a case of, yeah, I need those understory plants in there as well. I don't want a monoculture because the understory plants create that mesic ground cover, moisture retention, which allows the fungi to work. But actually it's a good, good question because it takes us to another world of grazing ecology. See, grasses are quite a unique, um, grasses are quite a unique, wonderful thing. They evolved very, very relatively recently, but they enable plants to colonize seasonally dry and seasonally cold habitats, right? And with before that, these habitats would have all been desertified deserts, and so grasses have extended plant life. And because they're seasonally dry and seasonally um, uh, cold, grasses have got, they've got this wonderful capacity where you, you shoot up, you grow like buggery in the uh, good season, right? And yes, you then set seed or you put the nutrients back into your rhizome roots and then you can go moribund, you can stagnate in the bad season, right? And the trouble is, though, if you leave that grass up there like that dry in the bad season, you're just inviting our mate fire to take over, aren't you? So you're just inviting, come on, pap, pap. You're inviting fire to burn it and basically take this whole thing back to desert, which isn't what you want or what nature wanted, right? And so what really has happened, nature says, look, I need to biodegrade this stubble in these very harsh conditions, but they're too dry for the fungi in situ on the ground. So nature actually evolved this really clever thing, and it's called a biodigester. It's a mobile biodigester. And basically it can take in this stuff and it creates then the optimum conducive habitat for biodigesting this stuff. But then it had to work out, well, look, okay, I've got this, bio, but how does it harvest this stuff? So you've got this biodigester, and so then I had to move it around. Now, she didn't use wheels, she used legs. Okay? And basically for the harvesting thing, she had this thing called a mouth, with ears and eyes to know what they're doing. And so she said, hey, look, here's a rumen, which is our mobile biodigest, just takes in cardboards, garbage basically, but it's full of microbes that are actually excellent at breaking down straw and cardboard. And we've got this uh, harvesting you know, head that can collect. And then we've got the business end, of course, and the business end is giving us biofertilizer. Okay. Now there's some methane that is obviously released because it's an anaerobic, um, anaerobic rumen, but that's okay because basically the amount of carbon they're eating, digesting, turning into humates, avoiding fire, is way, way more beneficial than the bit of methane, but we can talk about methane later on if you like. And we've got this biofertilizer that's being produced, right? And that's, of course, enriching and making that grassland ever more productive. Okay, so here we have a thing. You ask the question, how do we enhance fungal activities in these dry, inhospitable areas? In, in, hospital, in hospitable areas. 
And yeah, okay, here's one of nature's solution. Now these herbivores come in different form. They're insects, they're termites. There's a whole lot of other forms that we can, scales that we can use them at. But we've got to keep our mind open to all of them. The bottom line, the function of biodegrading that straw to not make it fire fuel. Fire versus fungi. More questions, more control. Oh yeah, please. Yeah, coming down from the top, yeah. Yeah, there was a hand here somewhere, wasn't it? Uh, in terms of uh, improving degraded land, yep. do you see a role for, um, like, where it's been compacted and you might want to start introducing a range of uh, trees in, across pasture to increase biodiversity, but where the soil has been compacted and you want to try and open it up to soil and moisture, do you see a, a, a role for deep ripping to, to improve, to improve the, the, the capacity for, for micro rhizome? Yes, absolutely. Look, uh, we're not purists, we're just, outcomes matter, right? So whatever gets the result, but with a proper accounting, the proper recognition of all the consequences of that. So yeah, nothing wrong with ripping, nothing wrong with fertilizers, et cetera, et cetera, as long as you are aware what it's doing, right? And yes, you can accelerate the process. And yes, so there's nothing puritanical. Yes, you can rip, right? But always be aware the diesel costs, the comp you know, other compaction costs, the you know, other consequences. The other thing is then you just don't do, I'm doing deep ripping, but then you say, look, okay, I can come in here with Natu natural native pioneer jackhammer plants. These are plants, deep rooted, strong, deep rooted root, uh, plants with roots that then colonize, open up, expand, you know, that soil profile. Many of them are weeds, right? Like we'll say, here's thistles. Well, look at the deep, strong, um, compaction busting roots that thistles produce. Now you might say, oh, oh, I'm not allowed to have thistle, I have to kill the thistles. But see, that's what I'm saying. Nature's sort of evolved thistles, just as it's involved these herbivores, to perform a function. And all the time we're reading ecologies to optimize those functions, those outputs. And yeah, let, let's not nail ourselves onto any cross, whatever works, whatever adds value, long-term, strategically, ecologically is good value. Cattle don't like to eat thistles. Cattle, they don't like thistles. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people don't like them. But they see, that's a plant. And as I said, if you can't beat it, eat it. And if you can't eat it, you might say, look, I'll put a crimp roller over it before it sets seed so that the weed inspector doesn't get angry. Because the, point, the law says you mustn't let that plant uh, spread, right? You mustn't. You mustn't assist the seed dispersal. So yeah, you've got to mulch it or whatever before it sets seed. I'm not, look, I'm st and on stage here, I'm not telling you you've got to plant thistles, but what I'm saying, there's all sorts of smart options like that, right? And we've just got to explore those. And look, weeds are simply just lists of plants that, you know, bureaucrats and agronomists have put on a list, you know? There's nothing God given about a list of weeds, you know? And often they're given for very specific reasons which may no longer apply in that situation. Salvation Jane is Patterson's curse. Same plan. Different sides of borders. You know, one government there, another government there. So, yeah. Yeah, another question at the front, yeah. Sorry. He's just talking about deep-rooted plants. Where does the dung beetle come into play there? Is he as good as? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've been talking about fungi, soil microbial ecology. There's a whole zoo of organisms, of course, involved with that, right? So dung beetles, yeah, biofertilizers, bio yes, of course it's dung. Then the dung beetle incorporating that. So we bring this whole diversity into the play, right? Uh, fungi are particularly important though because fungi, as we said, lichens, they're the primary source of fixation. They're extremely high value protein. So a lot of the other animals in the soil, 
and as we said, there's you know, more biomass in the soil than above ground, are living off those high quality proteins that the fungi are producing. So earthworms, etc., making this good stuff, are actually eating a lot of fungi and their secondary, you know, sort of basic colonizers. But definitely life, yeah, we're about restoring life. And as, as we were saying with this herbivore, look, in some areas, termites are fantastic. In the forests I was working in, Chrysopsata bimaculata, it's a leaf-eating insect, and it's basically a herbivore turning a third of the crown of these eucalypts back into insect frass fertilizer to drive that fungal carbon-nitrogen ratio biodegradation. So, you know, people say, oh, we've got insect defoliation, it's a pest, let's spray them. No way, the plant can put up plenty of leaf. It's farming the insects in its crown to feed nitrogen onto the litter to make that nutrient cycle better for its increased productivity. Well, I'd have a question. Um, Walter, Sam and Steph are going to be talking about how they use their cattle to um, regenerate their land. Yep. And in some carbon projects, people are pen penalised for having cattle. Could you talk about that, please? Yeah, look, uh, thanks, Nicola. And, and this is a little bit like the weeds thing. I mean, when they say in some, some bureaucrat is penalising them because they've looked at one side of the ledger and not both. Absolutely, it's profound. And I suppose this, this graph that we set here globally is, tells it all, doesn't it? Because, um, <laughs> you know, like we're just living in bullshit world because, see, I mean, we've been sold this equation and all this has been ignored. And, and so uh, the counting is completely, you know, like it's just all fraud, right? Because we're not looking at the total system. There's 250 billion tons a year, pit, sand pit we can play in, nature plays in. We're being victimized at this level and yet we're losing all the opportunities. And so if people say, yeah, cattle are, you know, like a negative in this carbon thing, well, show me the evidence. Actually, it's a very important point, methane. You see, I mean, I was in New Zealand working with those and that went all the way up to Jacinda, the Prime Minister, and she changed the policy because of it. You see, methane, oh, methane's bad, it's a greenhouse gas. Of course it's a greenhouse gas. And of course, all animals with anaerobic fermentation, including all of us, produce some of it, right? And of course, the cattle get the really the guts. Well, every year there's about 630 million metric tons of methane produced. Cattle collectively produce about 10% of that. So near 90% it is wetlands and rice paddies and fugitive emissions from gas fields and everything. So cattle are 10%. But cattle on grasslands produce 1% of that because 90% of the cattle now in these concentration camp CAFOs, right? And so then the grass-fed cattle in New Zealand and sheep in New Zealand are being kicked in the guts. They're producing 1%. But, oh, methane is bad, methane is bad. We've got to penalise. Well, the truth about methane is actually really, really profound because, again, it comes down to grassland ecology. So you've got a green grassland. What keeps a grassland green and healthy and transpiring? We've just said previously, herbivores, right? Without herbivore, it burns and goes back to desert. These grasslands are transpiring, of course, water, okay? Yeah, 30,000 litres per hectare per day. These are, tra I mean, healthy, green, transpiring grass. When that water vapour or that water goes into the atmosphere, you've got this guy up, or oh, I think it's a girl, this, this sun out here, you see, and then you've got solar radiation coming in. And you've got solar oxidisation of water, transpired water vapour molecules into hydroxyl ions, OH minus, plus hydrogen, which then forms bicarbonate ions and a whole lot of other uh, atmospheric chemical complexes. But the bottom line, it produces hydroxyl ions, okay? And hydroxyl ions are free radicals that are extremely efficient at oxidizing and cleaning up any carbon in the air, 
not just methane, carbon particulates, pollution, polyaromatic hydrocarbons. These are the laundries of the sky, you know, keeping our air safe and clean. Now, a cow grazing a pasture, sure, produces some methane, but by grazing and maintaining, what, two hectares of pasture, is producing a hundred times the hydroxyline photooxidation potential than its emissions. Okay? So we want to penalise that cow for this, but we don't want to credit the cow for a hundred times its ecological service function. That's a one, not a four. Okay? So what I'm saying is, hey, you just get our counting straight. I'm happy to go to the, any court you like, put the evidence, and send the governments an invoice to say, yeah, look, if you want to penalise my methane production, uh, start paying my invoices on photooxidation. And when Jacinda saw that, she said, shit, I'm not, I mean, she, no, she didn't say that. She said, I'm not going there, right? I'm not going there, because if, if the liability of these guys are going to send me invoices and have the scientific evidence to lay me flat on that, that that's a pretty dumb thing to do as a politician. So she basically just kicked it into side kick and no, there's no tax on methane New Zealand. Okay, but that, that's the equation again, like one to a hundred, right? Yes, cattle produce methane. Yes, cattle have all these other ecosystem functions. And when we start looking at them and counting for them, they are far, far more valuable. And that's what the whole story about the soil carbon sponge, right? We rebuild resilience, productivity, you know, as nature did 420 million years ago in the sponge, and here are all the dividends. And when you properly account for them, hey, you know, you're rich, you're empowered. You wouldn't think of anything else. I get a question up there? Yeah, please. Yeah, um, another, another political question. What is the effect on the soil of all the solar panels that are sitting above it and shading it on a permanent basis? <laughs> okay, now good, good, good point. What's the effect on the soil of the solar panel? Well, shade's not bad. It's a question of leaf area index. You know, a forest can have a leaf in area index of 10, 15 to 1, like 10 panels per square metre, right? And there's bug oil growth underneath it, 10 to 1, but, you know, but the point is, yeah, so shade isn't a bad thing. I take the other point, though, if you look at a conventional solar farm and you've got these panels there, you know, like a metre off the ground, so basically they, then they have to mow or they have to use, you know, weedicides to keep that grass from growing weedy, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, what are they doing? And of course, is what, what, how good is the grass? Have they got animals in there grazing the grass, putting biofertilizer back? Probably not. Have they sterilized productive farmland? Yes, could well be. So these are all negatives that we have to count for. But then you might make a suggestion, you might make a suggestion, why don't you lift your panels another metre higher off the ground? Because then they're less dusty, the same amount of sunshine, no troubles, but less dusty. But now you've got 1.8 metre, 2 metre head, and so now we can graze sheep underneath and maintain it until we have a polyculture of solar panels plus solar powered grasslands plus solar powered herbivores with biofertility, grazing, everything built in. See, so there's always win, 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 win solutions in this game. But yeah, if you just say, oh, I need this thousand hectares for solar panels, you sterilize the land and it doesn't have to be. There's smart solutions. So directly uh, solar power, yeah, it's just shade. Uh, generally shade can't hurt. It would take some of the heating of the soil away, but that can't hurt. You know, soils can heat up to 70 degrees centigrade excessively. So generally speaking, it's really sterilizing that land from natural grassland herbivore ecologies, which would be the biggest negative, yeah. But they're really win-win positives if you just say, let's redesign that in a new, smarter way.
Right no more questions? I think there'll be more opportunity to yeah, ask you questions. Always, always. And then, and obviously the other thing is we're very, very happy through Nakala and what have you, as, and, and your local teams, you know, like if there's things come up, you know, through Nakala, let us know and yeah, we can give you whatever background. The other thing I think I have to mention that obviously I'm giving you examples, but everything has to be looked at locally and sharp, smart, tailored solution designed to your local thing. It's very dangerous to say, oh, somebody did this in Zimbabwe, I'm going to do this here, because there may be 5% of the variables are slightly different. But the principles and the imperative is absolute and that applies everywhere. So thank you very much and I hope that, um, yeah, we can keep this debate going and yeah, go Deloraine, go Tasmania. Thank you very much. <laughs>